I get to Hanoi and I'm taken to the Hualo prison. Now Hualo is, was built in the 1890s by the French, so it is a Bastille type prison. The walls are about 15 feet high and about five feet thick. There's broken embedded wine bottles, glass, all the way, jagged glass all the way around the top. There's electrical wires like electrocution wires all the way around the top of those walls. And there are guard towers at the corners with machine guns. So this is a serious place. It was uh, scary. Lonely in a way, even though I did have three other guys with me in the truck going up. Uh, I was alone for the first week, but now I've had three guys with me. And the first night I get there to the Hanoi Hilton, I'm put in a cell that's six and a half feet by seven feet. Tiny cell for four guys, about the size of a small bathroom. And it was our bathroom because we had a three gallon bucket and fortunately it had a lid. But it was our, not only our bathroom, it was our living room, our bedroom, and our dining room for the next nine months. You know, in that situation, you are so vulnerable. We were being threatened all the time. The enemy was telling us that we had to cooperate with them. We had to choose between being uh, supportive of their cause or being a hardhead. And if we were supportive, then we would be treated leniently, humanely. And if we were not, that we would have hard times. Well, you know, 99% of us chose the hard road because we were committed to follow the code of conduct and to be an honorable soldiers. That was going to be a hard commitment to keep. So fear, yes, I was always afraid. Every cell had a speaker in it. And from that speaker, three times a day, we heard propaganda, but also some of those presentations on that speaker, they were telling us, again, about the two roads, the, the, the good road and the hard road, and that we would be tried as war criminals. And that was a serious threat that they were really talking about doing, and we learned later they really were going to planning to do that in 1967. So it was a very difficult time of worrying about the future, not knowing what the future would hold, but still having to stay positive in that situation and believe that someday we would walk out of there. Well, we had to know ourselves, as I mentioned earlier. Knowing myself was important. I did know that I was in the right place, and that was very important. I was in the right place because by personality, I'm a take charge person, I'm an adventurous person. By passion, I love flying, I was doing that. By values, I loved the military, uh, I always wanted to be a warrior and I felt like that I was willing to sacrifice to be that way. And uh, by my skills, I had the right skills to be a military leader and to be an Air Force pilot. So all of those things came together. But there was a part of me that was, I didn't really, hadn't really faced up to, being a very bold and courageous football player and fighter pilot and all that. But there were areas where I had fear, where I lacked confidence, where I was selfish, immature. Those things would come out too because there was no pretending in the POW camps. You, who you were came out. You couldn't hide because in that situation, you would be stripped down by the culture, by the enemy, and even by living with people in a cell 24 hours a day for years at a time, you couldn't hide who you were. It was gonna to come to the surface, and it did very quickly. This, we hear a lot today about being authentic and authentic leadership. That was the amazing thing about the POW camp. It stripped all of that pretense away, and we had to be authentic. 